Hi there, everybody. So it's Friday. Grab your popcorn, chips, whatever. We're continuing with the uh, Napoleonic Wars from one of the best history channels on YouTube, from History Epic History TV. Uh, one one thing, uh, a big shout out to Susan, who decided also to be a patron member. If you want to be or if you want to join our patron team, the link is going to be in the description below. And the link to the original video is going to be in the description below. Okay, let's see. Uh, the video is called Retreat from Moscow in 1812. We know how that went, but let's see how they're going to depict it. Peace lies in Moscow. Russia, 1812. Napoleon invades his former ally with the largest army Europe has ever seen. But for the French Emperor, the decisive blow remains frustratingly beyond reach. Russia's resilience is unlike anything he's ever encountered. And as winter closes Gracias. in, his army begins the most infamous retreat in history. One thing I would say, and tell me if you have another opinion in the comment section, but I think uh, by the time that he planned or it started to invade Russia, I think that he was pretty much overconfident because he had great victories in Europe, but as we all Europeans know, and I think a lot of people who, you know, like are interested in history and, and, and watch different topics in history, Russia is another beast. You always need to, you know, like Russia isn't like any other country in Europe. So it's always another beast. But I think that he was overconfident um, going into Russia. The 15th of September, 1812. 83 days after invading Russia, a week after his costly victory at Borodino, Napoleon entered Moscow. He expected to be greeted by dignitaries, formally offering the city's surrender. Instead, he discovered that 90% of Moscow's inhabitants had fled. Yep. A fire had started the previous night and was blamed on drunken soldiers. But over the next 48 hours, fires continued to break out across Moscow, until most of the city was ablaze. Count Fyodor Rostopchin, the city's governor, had ordered that Moscow be destroyed rather than allowed to fall into enemy hands. And now fires were being started deliberately by Russian criminals freed from jail and acting on police orders. French soldiers rounded up and shot any they could catch. But the inferno was impossible to contain. Yeah, they're, they're still using the, the tactic of scorch earth and they're even so, uh, 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 how to say it, like they, they, they're even prepared to burn down Moscow. But in that, as the French started to execute all the uh, different, you know, like uh, people who started the fires, a lot of the civilian population that was still left there also took the consequences. So a lot of innocent people also died. But I'm interested what happened to the to the general that or whatever the 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 the, the guy, the, the the main guy in the city who ordered it. What happened to him? Was he also hang or hanged or something like that? In four days, two-thirds of Moscow was destroyed. With the fires finally under control, Napoleon's soldiers turned their attention to systematically looting the ruined city. While from his new quarters in the Kremlin, Napoleon sent a letter to Emperor Alexander in St. Petersburg, inviting him to make peace and end the war. He received no reply. Napoleon waited, confident that Alexander would eventually negotiate. But as the days passed, he grew increasingly uneasy. 
Cossack raids were disrupting his vital communications with Paris, as well as the arrival of supplies. While the steady attrition of French forces and Russian reinforcements meant Napoleon was outnumbered for the first time in the campaign. Rumours also reached him that his reluctant allies, Prussia and Austria, were in secret talks with his enemies. Napoleon had proposed that the army winter in Moscow, but that now looked too dangerous. Reluctantly, he accepted that the army would have to move back to Smolensk to find safe winter quarters. Napoleon knew how severe Russian winters could be, but continued to put off his departure, reassured by fine October weather, and hoping that at the last minute there might be a message from Alexander offering peace. It never came. On the 13th of October, the first light snow fell. Five days later, Kutuzov launched a surprise attack on Murad's advance guard at Vinkova and defeated it. Napoleon, stung into action, gave the order for the army to leave Moscow the next day. Yeah, he... he... Our video okay, sponsor, sponsor time. The legendary World of Tanks is the home of... Online yeah, I think that... that... It was a wise de decision for him to retreat from Moscow because it was not a position that he could hold, especially as we talked so much because of the supply line. Uh, and as he said, just imagine that Prussia and Russia went into an open rebellion against him. They would definitely cut up his supply line and supply chain, uh, supply chain that came from the German lands and France. If if Prussia and Austria went into open defiance to him at that time period, he would be cut off and, and I think the whole army would be annihilated. So his decision to withdraw now, I think, was a pretty reasonable and good one. Oh, here comes Alexander! 100,000 men of the Grande Armée left Moscow in a column 10 miles long, with an estimated 40,000 carriages and carts. There were women and children too, army wives and the vivandières, the women who cooked for the soldiers, yep. as well as some civilians. Every wagon and pack was stuffed with as much food and loot as possible. As he Oops, off, sorry. Sergeant Bourgogne of the Imperial Guard made an inventory of his pack. It contained several pounds of sugar, some rice, some biscuit, half a bottle of liqueur, a woman's Chinese silk dress embroidered in gold and silver, several gold and silver ornaments amongst them. That's, the that's also of something that, that was... I would say detrimental, de detrimental to the Grande Armée because they had so much loot and it would slow them, them down so much and a lot of the... Um, when an order came from Napoleon to drop it so that the army could move faster, a lot of them left the regular army and just started to be scattered around and they didn't want to let the loot behind. So they got caught off by, I don't know, Cossacks and partisan, uh, different partisan groups in Russia and so on. Firearms, powder flask and 60 cartridges in the box. But just imagine carrying that. It slows your army This heavily encumbered army did not yet realize it was in a race against time. The Russians were beginning to move against the flanks of Napoleon's 550 mile deep salient. That very day, Wittgenstein's army was driving back Marshal Saint-Cyr's outnumbered force at Polatsk and drawing Victor's IX Corps west to support them. In the south, Admiral Chichagov's advance had Schwarzenberg's Austrian Corps falling back to cover Warsaw. The corridor was closing. And then there was the weather. Though Napoleon was confident his army could reach winter quarters in Smolensk in 20 days. 
well before the more extreme temperatures were due to hit. Napoleon planned to withdraw via Kaluga, through unspoilt country where the army could forage for supplies. But Kutuzov sent General Dokturov's 6th Corps to block the road at Mala Yaroslavets. In fierce fighting, Italian troops of Eugène's 4th Corps drove the Russians out of the town. It was a hard-won victory, reminiscent of the fighting at Borodino. Kutuzov now stood between Napoleon and Kaluga. And, and just imagine that, so it was a multi-ethnical army, and you know, like, uh, you could tell some German soldiers, you know, like, when they're fighting against, I don't know, Prussians or whatever, you can tell them, you know, like, you're fighting for your freedom, you're fighting for the interest of your country, or what, you can tell that also to the Croats, to the Italians, and so on. But if you go with them to Russia, to Moscow, I mean... What are you going to tell them, uh, you know, like they're, they're going to notice that you're taking them somewhere to further your own interest. You know, like it's, it's more hard to push out a propagandistic message to other ethnicities if they're far, far away from home or for the, from their home territory or neighborhood. Napoleon now took the unusual step of conferring with his marshals. And after discussing various options, he decided that rather than seek another major battle, they would retreat the way they'd come, along the Smolensk Road. Napoleon had hoped to avoid this route, as it meant marching back through country already stripped bare of supplies. The day after the fighting at Mala Yaroslavets, Napoleon was nearly captured by a group of Cossacks and saved only by General Rapp's charge at the head of his escort. After this close shave, Napoleon had a phial of poison made up, which he carried around his neck in case of capture. Later on, he tried to kill himself with that, with a small capsule. I think when, when he lost at uh, Waterloo, but, I, but I'm not sure. Don't mess with the Cossacks. Napoleon's army set off on its new course, shadowed at a respectful distance by Kutuzov's army to the south. They passed the old battlefield of Borodino, a grisly, unnerving sight where crows pecked at half-buried corpses. Relentless marching quickly began to tire out men and horses. A few days later, the temperature fell below freezing. The army's overworked, starving horses four. died en masse. Discipline began to break down, as some drivers simply dumped the sick and wounded by the roadside to try to ensure their own survival. As the French column became increasingly strung out, General Miloradovich, commanding Kutuzov's advance guard, fell on Davout's rear guard outside Vyazma. For a few hours, Davout's first corps was cut off, until Eugène and Ney came to his rescue. The battle ended with street fighting in Vyazma, as the French hastily evacuated the burning town. For the soldiers of the Grande Armée, so unaccustomed to retreats and routs, Vyazma was an alarming, demoralizing blow. And what people often forget is that not only the French suffered in the winter, the Russian military did the same and On the civilians November, also. It began to snow heavily. The next night, temperatures plummeted to minus 20 degrees centigrade. Oh my god, minus 20. Few men or women had proper winter clothing or access to shelter. Many froze to death overnight. The next morning, wagons and guns were abandoned. Many soldiers sought to save themselves, ignoring officers, stealing horses and food, 
and leaving the column to scour the countryside for supplies. Many of these foragers were found by the Cossacks. Some of course. cut down or lanced, others robbed of every possession and left to freeze. In a few cases, they were handed over to peasants, eager for retribution against the foreign invaders who had plundered all they owned. Oh, don't, don't give As them the to the peasants. As the army struggled on towards Smolensk through blizzards, Napoleon ordered Eugène's Fourth Corps to strike out for Vitebsk, where there were large French supply depots. But Vitebsk had already fallen to the Russians. Fourth Corps was too weak to fight its way through, and rejoined the army, minus its artillery and most of its baggage. A colonel who saw Fourth Corps at this stage described men without shoes, almost without clothes, exhausted and famished, sitting on their packs, sleeping on their knees, and only rousing themselves out of this stupor to grill slices of horse meat or melt bits of ice. Just three weeks after leaving Moscow, a horse third meat. of the army was dead or captured. About half the rest formed a growing army of stragglers, men without units, prepared to fight only to survive. Uh, one thing about horse meat, I never tried it. I would like to try it just to see how it, how it is. But I never tried it. But as far as I know, isn't horse meat a speciality or whatever na part of national dishes in France or something like that? I'm not. I'm not sure. But I think that it's from from that time period. Uh, let me know. Let me know if you know that in the comment section below. But I'm sure that, kind of sure that horse meat is kind of you know like traditional whatever meals in France, in parts of France. Napoleon reached Smolensk on the 9th of November. The first troops into town ransacked the supply depots, leaving nothing for those who followed, including Ney's rearguard, which arrived six days later. Napoleon had hoped to make Smolensk his winter base, but the state of the army and lack of supplies meant the retreat had to continue. But the five days he spent there gave Kutuzov time to circle ahead and prepare an ambush. When the French retreat resumed, he struck 30 miles west of Smolensk at Krasny. In three days of desperate fighting through knee-deep snow, Napoleon used his Imperial Guard to hold open the road, as Eugène and Davout's corps fought their way through the ambush with heavy losses. Two regiments of the Young Guard were ordered to make a sacrificial counterattack to keep the Russians at bay, and were virtually annihilated. Kutuzov held back many of his troops and was blamed for not trying to destroy Napoleon's army when he had the chance. It's possible he was concerned at the number of raw conscripts in his own army also suffering terribly in the freezing conditions. So the Russians are just trying to kind of stall uh, the retreat and, and, you know, like just cut pieces from, from the French army. And then maybe engage in Not a decisive battle. Not every French corps broke through at Krasny. Marshal Ney and his 6,000 strong rearguard arrived on the 18th of November to find the road blocked by 60,000 Russian troops and no sign of the promised support from Davout's first corps. Ney's men hurled themselves against the Russian lines with desperate courage, but were mown down. Rejecting several invitations to surrender, Ney led the survivors in a daring night crossing of the Dnipro River, then across 45 miles of open country under constant attack from Platov's Cossacks to reach Osha. By the time Ney rejoined the army, his rear guard was down to just 800 fighting men, leading a column of several thousand stragglers. Just look at his face like, oh my god, we really did it, we really did it. The army regarded his escape as a miracle, and when Napoleon heard of it, he immediately dubbed Marshal Ney the bravest of the brave.
Oh, now he thinks it's it's starting to get very serious. I mean, the it is. Had escaped one trap, but now three Russian armies were closing in from different directions and outnumbered him nearly three to one. From the east, Kutuzov's main army with sixty-five thousand men. From the north, Wittgenstein with thirty thousand, steadily driving back Marshal Victor's Ninth Corps, and from the south. Admiral Chichagov's army of Moldavia, with 34,000, having detached General Ostenzaken with 30,000, to prevent Schwarzenberg's Austrians and Renier's Saxon Corps marching to Napoleon's aid. Bruh. Napoleon was heading for Minsk, a major French supply base with vast stores of the food, clothing, shoes and ammunition that his army so desperately needed. But on the 21st of November, disastrous news arrived. Minsk had fallen to Chichagov. He'd then marched on Borisov, driven out the Polish garrison, and captured its bridge over the Berezina River. So what now? By rights, the Berezina ought to have frozen solid by now, so Napoleon could have crossed anywhere. But a sudden thaw had turned the river into a torrent of ice and freezing water. So is he going to try to escape via Napoleon Vilnius was at least or joined by the hard fighting Marshal Udino and his second corps, which hadn't suffered as badly as the main column on its retreat from Polatsk. Udino launched an immediate counterattack on Borisov and retook the town couldn't stop the Russians burning the bridge. With no other bridge for miles in either direction, it seemed Napoleon's exhausted army was finally doomed. But there was one sliver of hope. Polish cavalry had found a ford across the river, near the village of Studienka. Napoleon issued a flurry of orders. Second Corps was to fake preparations for a river crossing south of Borisov. Victor's Ninth Corps, arriving from the north, was to form a rear guard east of Studienka to hold the Russians at bay, while engineers worked as quickly as possible to build pontoon bridges across the river and win Napoleon's army a fighting chance of escape. On the afternoon of the 25th of November, General Eble's Dutch engineers began building two 300-foot pontoon bridges across the Berezina River. They worked day and night, sometimes chest deep in freezing water, and completed both bridges in less than 24 hours. Few of the engineers survived the ordeal. Chichagov had been totally Trust me, I'm an engineer. by the diversion south of Borisov, and was moving his troops south to face it, allowing Napoleon's army to begin crossing its rickety bridges virtually unopposed. Udino's Second Corps led the way to secure a bridgehead, followed the next day by the remnants of the main army. Priority was given to formed troops, still able to fight. For the time being, the army's vast crowd of stragglers remained on the far bank. By the time Chichagov realised his mistake and began moving north, Napoleon had troops in place to defend the crossing. On the east bank, General Partonneur's 12th Division, 4,000 relatively fresh troops from Victor's 9th Corps, formed the rearguard. As Platov's Cossacks approached from the east, the vanguard of Kutuzov's main army, Partonneur tried to rejoin 9th Corps. But caught in a swirling blizzard, with visibility down to 50 metres, he marched straight into Wittgenstein's army. His entire division was killed or captured. 4,000 men. 
The next morning, God. Chichagov and Wittgenstein launched coordinated attacks on both sides of the river. There was desperate fighting on the West Bank, where Marshal Udino was, yet again, seriously wounded. But his Swiss infantry held the line, until General Dumerck's cuirassiers, the army's last heavy cavalry, charged and routed the Russians. At great cost, Polish and German troops of Victor's rearguard held off the Russians until dark, then pulled back across the bridges. For two nights, officers had been trying to get the vast camp of stragglers to cross the bridges when they weren't being used. But with temperatures reaching minus 30 centigrade, they'd preferred to stay put, huddled around their fires. At dawn on the 29th, with the army leaving and the Russians approaching, thousands of stragglers surged in panic towards the bridges. Oh my god! Dozens were crushed underfoot. Others fell or were pushed into the water, or tried to swim, which was certain death. When French engineers burned the bridges at 9am, thousands were cut off and left to the mercy of the advancing Cossacks. Some became prisoners. Others were simply put out of their misery. Oh God. Uh, it would be interesting if there is a statistic or something um, who the stragglers mostly were, like which, uh, which, which nationality like. Uh, I would say or think that most of the French soldiers in in the in the Grande Armée uh, were still, you know, like in the normal formations and so on. And I would say, kind of, from a logic, kind of, I don't know, a logical perspective, that maybe most of the stragglers were either, you know, like German soldiers or maybe Italian, uh, Croat soldiers. So I mean, from other uh, ethnicities. But I'm pretty, I would say, pretty sure that French and Polish soldiers were still part of the regular army or the regular root army. If somebody knows where to find that statistic, you know where, where to put it. The retreat began 43 days earlier. The Grande Armée had marched nearly 500 miles under constant attack, starved, exhausted, and for the last 23 days in lethal sub-zero temperatures without proper clothing or shelter. In that time, the fighting strength of the Grande Armée had been reduced from around 124,000 men to 20,000, with as many stragglers still following the army. As the retreat continued to Vilna, the weather turned even worse, the temperatures falling to minus 37 degrees centigrade. Oh my god, 37. The Russian armies, at least now, held back, leaving Just the look winter, at this. Cossacks and Russian peasants to finish off the invaders. On the 5th of December, Napoleon left the army, travelling incognito across Europe at breakneck speed, and reaching Paris So he in left the army! Days. No way! No way! Naturally, English satirists capitalized on Napoleon, seeming to abandon his defeated army. And many soldiers did regard it as an act of betrayal. But I can kind of understand him because But his generals it's... supported his decision to leave. There'd already been one attempted coup against Napoleon in Paris. And there was much work to be done to rebuild the army and reassure France's allies. Yeah, I, I, from a logical perspective, I think, yeah, it, it was it was pretty important for him to gain back his political capital. And as he said, to ensure, you know, like different allies, we're still OK, we still have an army, everything's under control and so on. But I think it was a big hit for his, you know, like reputation in the army, I would say. What what do you think about that? What do you personally think about that decision from a logical perspective? 
Was it more a of a plus or a minus for him? On the 9th of December, 51 days after the retreat began, around 20,000 ragged survivors of the Grande Armée began crossing the Nyman River back into friendly Polish territory. According to legend, Marshal Ney was the last man across. Well, this is K to the P. This one is called Money, aka the root of all evil. Money, money. Money, 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 money. <laughs> what? The root of all evil. Why do I get those ki those kinds of advertisements? <laughs> Napoleon's invasion of Russia had proved to be one of the greatest military disasters in history. He had made fatal miscalculations about geography, logistics, and above all, Russia's political and strategic response to his invasion. These blunders cost his empire around half a million men, as well as a quarter of a million horses and a thousand cannon. Put another way, of every 12 men who marched into Russia with the Grande Armée, one was killed in action or died of wounds. Two were taken prisoner, one of whom died in captivity. Seven died from disease or the effects of climate. Just two returned Oh my alive. God, I'm getting goosebumps or whatever it's called oh my god just look at this and you need to take into account once again it was a multi-ethnical uh, 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 army so Croats dying there it was also a hit for you know like his uh, his reputation inside of the Illyrian provinces you know like okay maybe not Polish soldiers dying because he had a strong foothold in Poland but in German soldiers dying there. I think that most of the soldiers who died there were actually in Russia were actually German soldiers. Uh, the same with Austrian soldiers, Italian soldiers. So it was a big blow to all of his allied um, countries throughout Europe, I would say. Contrary to myth, many more soldiers had died in the summer advance from heat, typhus and dysentery than were lost in the winter retreat. Russian military casualties were estimated at 150,000 and a huge but unknown number of civilian deaths. Yeah. The Russian campaign was a catastrophe for Napoleon. Not just in lost troops and resources, but in damage to prestige and reputation that winter, all his enemies sensed weakness and prepared to join forces against him. But the Emperor wasn't going down without a fight. Back in Paris, he admitted to his ministers, Fortune has dazzled me, gentlemen. I've let it lead me astray. Instead of following my plan, I went to Moscow. I thought I'd make peace there. I stayed too long. I've made a grave mistake but I'll have the means to repair it. Sorry. Thank you to all the Patreon supporters who make this Once again, possible. shout out to and their to patrons sponsor, and World to Attack. Epic History TV. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it, uh, you know, like the Napoleonic Wars and every major war that happened in Europe always give me as an European goosebumps uh, because of all the, you know, like, lost life and everything but it's history we're humans and those things unfortunately happen all the time okay uh, as always uh, if you want to be part of this community if you have any anything interesting to say uh, or to add feel free to do it in the comment section if you want to be part of this community just hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you want to be a patron member the link is in the description below the link to the original videos in the description below and our Discord server 
is also in the description below okay hope that you enjoyed it uh, put aside your popcorn and chips wherever you had for the next time when we continue with the epic uh, history tv's series see you until next time bye